The Move, Look, and Listen podcast with Dr. Doug Steffi is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial Audible membership at audibletrial.com forward slash inbound. You'll find over 180,000 titles to choose from, including several books mentioned here in the podcast. Support the Move, Look, and Listen podcast by visiting audibletrial.com forward slash inbound. If our two eyes are not working together well as a fast, synchronized team, our internal map quest continues to be off. It's consistently inconsistent with our ability to judge time and space. Those that don't feel well grounded, those that have some measure of anxiety, oftentimes it starts in the visual system. If you can't move, look, and listen in a fast, accurate, effortless, sustainable, age-appropriate, meaningful way, you're in a world of hurt. There's a whole world in vision and how it affects brain function that no one's ever shared with you. 2020 is perceived as the holy grail of going to the eye doctor. Well, I'm here to change that paradigm. This is episode three of the Move, Look, and Listen podcast with Dr. Steffi. I'm Tim Edwards with the Inbound Podcasting Network. Happy to have Dr. Steffi with us here in our roster of shows as we move forward in the Move, Look, and Listen podcast. Dr. Steffi, we've talked about common eye problems in our last episode, and now you alluded to this topic in our last episode, and this is, I think, something that's quite interesting and I think might raise an eyebrow or two of somebody listening on the other side of the speakers. 2020 is not enough. You've said that from the first day that I've met you you and I've known you a couple of years now, 2020 is not enough. We've been told our whole lives, oh, I got perfect vision. You can see 2020. (laughs) Not the case, apparently. That is not the case. (laughs) That's right. 2020 is presented as a holy grail of going to the optometrist. (laughs) And it is, I'm here to tell you, it is a tiny piece of the puzzle. It's an important piece Mm -hmm. because clarity of vision is a big deal, right? but it's only a piece. So for example... Picture a three-circle Venn diagram. Okay. And one circle is, can you see 2020? One circle is related to eye health. Make sure you don't have dry eye or glaucoma or macular degeneration or bleeding in the eye if you're a diabetic or uh, any untold number of eye health issues. That's circle two. Mm -hmm. Circle one and circle two is where most eye doctors practice. They do have a place for sure, and they do have value. But there's a third circle that oftentimes is missing. And within that third circle, there's pieces like eye teaming, eye focusing, eye tracking. There's components related to visual auditory integration, visual cognitive skills, visual spatial skills, visual attention, visual processing speed, magnocellular vision or motion processing visual vestibular or vision and inner ear integration issues. There's a lot of stuff going on in that third circle. And and my experience over the years is that if you don't do vision therapy in your practice, you tend to ignore that third circle. I went to a lunch meeting a number of years ago at a local credit union. They did lunch meetings for their employees. They invited me to come as a speaker and I talked about this specific topic, and I was talking about eye teaming, eye focusing, and eye tracking, and that if you didn't have those skills, you might get sleepy or tired when you read, you might get headaches when you read, you might get motion sickness when you ride in the car, you might have to be the driver because if you don't, you get dizzy or motion sick, that you're ridiculously clumsy, can't play sports that include catching a ball or throwing a ball accurately, and one of the, one of the attendees they were sitting in the back, they raised their hand and they said, hey, so, so what kind of questions do I need to tell my eye doctor the next time I have an eye exam? And I said, if you have to tell your doctor what kind of questions he should be asking you, you're going to the wrong eye doctor. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, what you just said, you, you really mentioned a, a good portion of the population there, Dr. Steffi, with all of those things that people might be suffering from. Tim, the, the list is ridiculous. Right. So just a quick review, headaches, migraines, motion sickness, ADHD, autism, dyslexia, learning disorder, clumsiness, 
can't play sports, uncoordinated. It goes on and on. And all I of mean, those the, sit inside that third circle. They really sit inside that third circle. And you That's said exactly a minute ago that most optometrists disregard that circle or don't even acknowledge that it exists. So what do you do in your practice that's different so that you can well, help people that are suffering from this? Well, there's another story to tell you. I was at a meeting a long, long time ago, probably more than 20 years ago. I used to be involved with our state association politically before my first daughter was born. And when I would meet people around the state, I might ask the question, hey, remember when we were in optometry school, what was the, what was the percentage of patients that, that were thought to have vision therapy related problems and almost to a doctor, they'd always come up with 10 to 20%. Seems rather small. Well, if we look at the population at large, that's probably not unreasonable. Hmm. The prevalence of those problems go way up almost to everybody. If you have any of those diagnoses I mentioned a minute ago, right? But population at large, I say, okay, I'll give you the 10 to 20%. So let's say that you do 10 exams a day and you work five days a week. So you're seeing 50 patients a week. So you're telling me that you're talking to five to 10 patients a week about vision therapy. And then that's when things get quiet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and their eyes get big as saucers mm -hmm. because they're running a movie in their head about When's the last time I talked about vision therapy now, to anybody? Do they not because they don't know enough about it? Or do they not because they don't have time to take on the caseload? No. Or, or, and, or should they because there's actually for more revenue to be generated? Well, this has been my impression. It's not because they don't have the training, because we all get this training when we go to optometry school. So it's not that. Their go-to answer historically was, well, Doug, I, I don't really see patients like that in my practice. And my typical answer was, I believe that you don't see them. It doesn't mean they're not there. Mm. Well put. So yeah. I think there was truth in their statement. They don't see them. And the reason they don't see them is because they don't ask the same kind of questions that I ask. And they don't do the kind of testing that's going to reveal those kinds of problems. It's true. And, I, and, I, and what's fun to watch is because I've had a front row seat, not only uh, to be the one that you were asking those questions to, but I, I recently brought my wife in uh, to, to meet with you to, to fix an ailment she's been suffering from. And the look on her face as you were asking some of these questions was hilarious to me because these are not questions that, that one normally gets asked when they're sitting in the chair at the optometrist office. No, you never you get asked these no, questions. You, you dig deep and you find solutions by digging deep. You know, one of the things that I've thought for a long time about what sets my practice apart from most is that whenever I have an encounter, I'm going to presume you have one of these problems until I ask you enough questions or do enough testing to prove to me that you don't. To omit it. Gotcha. That is a completely different mindset yeah. because I've had patients come where, where they have complained about a lot of the questions I'm going to ultimately ask of them and discuss. They've brought up these issues with many of their past exams and then get shined on. So that's even more egregious. If you never ask the questions and the doctor doesn't find your problem, that's one thing. But if you're actually complaining about stuff and your, your needs still go unaddressed, that's just wrong. And I, I, can't, I can't practice that way. I'll give you a good example. Mm -hmm. I got a phone call from a medical group yesterday who was calling me to work out a contract to provide vision therapy to a mutual patient of ours. This gal has an HMO that I'm not contracted with. I wrote her a treatment letter. It's been a long fought battle. It's been, I kid you not, probably nine months since she started this trial mm. with her medical group and her parent insurance company. Mm. Around and around they go, well, somebody from the medical group calls me yesterday and she said, I never heard of medical insurance paying for vision therapy. Okay. Well, I, I don't know what to tell you. 
And then she said, well, one of my kids did vision therapy years ago, and I paid for it out of pocket. Well, maybe your eye doctor should have had this conversation with you and been a better advocate for you. Mm -hmm. And then I said, by any chance, did that child have an IEP or a 504 plan at school? And she said, well, they had a 504 plan. And I said, well, your optometrist should have told you that vision therapy should have been funded by your school district as well. And they didn't tell you that either. And that's going to be one of the upcoming episodes that we do where we really dig deep into special education regulations and what these kids are not getting and how to be a better advocate for your child and really go out and fight for their educational rights. Because there's a lot of them. And and we're going to spend at least one episode really drilling that down right. so that you'll be much more knowledgeable about how to go fight for your kids' rights. So then when this gal's on the phone with me, and I know now that she's got a child who's got a history of needing vision therapy, well, I started to ask her some of my standard questions. Do you get sleepy and tired when you read? Does overhead fluorescent lights bother you when one of the bulbs starts to flicker? Does, are you bothered by bright sign light and glare? And she, of course, she starts answering yes to all my questions. And so we really kind of finished the conversation and she said, you know what? I need to, I, I've been putting off making an appointment. <laughs> and that's not the reason she was talking to you in the first no, place. No, <laughs> heavens no. No. So she made an appointment to come and see me before we got off the phone. I love it. So, oh, so and I did the same thing. I went back to Illinois to visit family back in November hmm. and went up to the local small town bank that I grew up in. And the person who's working with us at the bank, I start to ask him some of the same questions. And show, sure enough, he's got problems with the way his two eyes work together. So it doesn't make a difference who I'm meeting, where I'm meeting them. If it lends itself to have this conversation, we'll start to have it. And I'm never surprised anymore about really how commonplace these problems are and nobody's finding it out. Hopefully, you begin to understand that 2020, in fact, is not enough. And there's that third circle in the Venn diagram that holds a whole bunch of magic in that third circle. And those are about diagnosis. So you can't have a treatment option or you can't have a treatment plan if you don't have a good diagnosis. So we've got to dig deep into the third circle and do the kind of testing that's required to determine what's really happening. And then once we know that information, we can come up with a treatment plan and how we're going to manage these things. And there's, there's short-term goals and there's long-term goals. Short-term goal for me is I want to improve your quality of life. If you get migraine headaches, I want you to have them less or to get rid of them altogether. If you're motion sick and you limit your travel because how sick you get driving in the car, well, then I want to make a short-term goal. I want you to be able to drive in the car, go to the local mountains, whatever, go to the amusement park, ride in the teacups at Disneyland, no. whatever, whatever it takes. Those days are done. I can check that box <laughs> <laughs> or I need to go see you because <laughs> we just got back from a Disney world vacation. Just looking at the teacups made me a little queasy. So, <laughs> well, that's a, that's a magnocellular vision problem, Tim. Well, let's fix it then. So I can go on the teacups again with my kids. <laughs> so short-term goals are about improving your quality of life. How do we go about doing that? Well, I go about doing that primarily by being sensitive to your prescription needs, not just the conventional farsighted, nearsighted astigmatism. One thing I've learned over the years is that there are many patients who are super sensitive to the tiniest amount of change. And because there's a tremendous amount of our brain space, if you will, that's allocated towards vision and vision processing, I might make the tiniest change in your prescription and you think I can walk on water because of how much better it feels. So we normally prescribe lenses in quarter diopter units, right? We go from a minus a quarter to a minus a half to minus three quarters to minus one, so on. But if you're really sensitive to what I'm alluding to, I might refract you down to an eighth of a diopter. So it's a 0.12 power change. And I've had a number of patients over the years where I make an eighth of a diopter change in one or both lenses, and it immediately changes their quality of life. Can you do their that? entire perception changes. 
Can you do that with contacts as well, or are they all just made in quarter increments? You cannot get an eighth of a doctor in a contact lens as far as I know. Mm-hmm. In a soft lens, you can get an eighth of a doctor, I believe, in a hard lens. Gotcha. Yep. So the first is be sensitive to the patient's prescription. Sometimes it's being sensitive to the frame that they're wearing. So one of the things that I do in my exam room, I've got two black clips that are a, they're like a black plastic ring that is about maybe a inch and three quarters in diameter. And I can clip them over your glasses. And what I will, what I will oftentimes do is have patients look at my standard eye chart. I sneak these two little black clips out of my drawer and put them over your glasses and ask you to tell me how my eye chart looks and how it feels. And namely, is it clearer and is it calmer? And that's the, the difference, how it feels. Yes, because oftentimes people will pull back away from my black rings and they'll say, what? I'm like, I want to know if it's clearer, but I'm also interested in whether it feels calmer. Mm-hmm. And so now they've got a new context of what to pay attention to because nobody's ever asked them how it feels to see, just how clear is it to see? Now explain that. There might be our friends on the other side of the speakers that are saying or thinking, what do you mean how it feels to see? Well, if you have a problem with motion processing or binocular vision or visual vestibular or visual inner ear integration issues, you don't feel calm when you see. Bit of tension going on, like some anxiety associated with it. Yes, and that's going to be in one of the next episodes where we talk about the polyvagal theory of affect, emotion, self-regulation, and communication. And that's going to be a really fun episode to do because it's Mm -hmm. one of my favorite topics to talk about. Absolutely. So when we look around every day and every waking second of every day, it ties into us subconsciously asking ourselves the question, do I feel safe? Well, if you look around and can't answer that question, then you're not going to feel safe and you're more likely to be highly distractible, highly anxious, highly fearful, and that does not feel calm. If you're in a perpetual state of fight or flight, that does not feel calm. But because nobody's ever asked you that question before, if you have those kinds of experiences, you don't even know that there could be a vision component to those experiences. So let's simplify that a little bit because you said, uh, does one feel safe when they look around? Now, that goes back to our primitive days, right? It's it's primal (laughs) in terms terms of feeling safe. And you're not talking about if you're in a good or bad neighborhood. You're talking about how you're processing the information that you can see. I'm, I'm talking about you roll out of bed in the morning in your own home. And your brain is looking around and asking itself the question, do I feel safe? And an example of that would be if you have a TV in your bedroom. And if you've ever noticed, if the room lights are dark and you stand off to the side, the TV images that are generated, it it really has a strobe-like effect. There's a great deal of flicker involved with the changing of that imagery. Well, if you're the kind of patient I'm talking about, You don't like flicker. You don't like flicker. You don't like bright sunlight and glare. You don't like movement in your periphery. And you don't like regular repeating patterns. Certain stripes, checkerboards, plaids, polka dots. Certain patterns really, really bother you. And that's where where one might not feel safe. Because they bother them. Those things that you're talking about, they're, they're troublesome. It is troublesome. So it's like a it's like a neon sign flashing in your brain that says, look here, look here, look here, look here, look here. And like a tractor beam, you can't help but look, but you're more miserable when you do so. It's like the proverbial moth to the flame. One of the other questions that I love asking, and when I get this as a yes answer, it really makes my day. Because one of the questions I'll ask people is, hey, when you drive in the carpool lane, and the concrete dividers whiz past your peripheral vision, does that bother you? Well, I can't tell you how many people 
when I say, when you drive in the carpool lane, I don't do that. Yeah, because <laughs> that's right. They can yeah. stop you right there. It bothers me, right? <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> but here's my favorite part of that question. And that's when I follow up and I say, okay, so has it ever felt like your car was demonized mm -hmm. and going to drive itself into the wall? <laughs> and that's when they look at me like, how could you possibly know that? Well, that is a perfect example of whether one feels safe or not with the information their eyes are bringing into their brain. Yes. And, and, and for those people that say, that's exactly how I feel. Yes, it feels like the car is going to drive itself into the wall. Mm -hmm. how, like, how could you possibly know that? And then, I, then we have a chuckle about it because I say, I'm pretty sure nobody else has ever asked you that question. And I'm pretty convinced you've never offered it up as a symptom because people would think you were crazy. Yeah. But when you, when you don't see fast and you've got that movement in your periphery zinging along in the periphery, it, it, again, it's like a tractor beam to your attention. Your, your attention goes that way. Your eyes go that way. Your head wants to turn that way. And when your hands are on the steering wheel, when you, when you, when you physically want to turn your head and look to the left, Sometimes your arms want to move in the direction your head turns and there goes the steering wheel and the car is going to want to drive itself right into the wall. And those are the folks that are, even if they don't avoid the carpool lane, they, they white knuckle it the whole time they're in there. They break out in the cold sweat. They tell everybody in the car, don't talk to me right now. I'm concentrating. They turn off the, the radio, radio yeah. <laughs> and they break out in the cold sweat. Yeah. Because they're exhausted when they get to where they're going. Now, that's just one example. There are many things, like oh. you said, that people go throughout their day. That's just an obvious example. But little things throughout the day that trouble people, they might not even know that it's troubling them until you put that clip back to your exam again. Yes. You put so, we put the, on the so we put the black clips on. And oftentimes they will tell me, well, yes, it's clear and calmer. I really like these lenses. Yeah. And then I take my black clips back that have no lenses in them, and I stick my finger through the empty black hole. And then they look at me like, what, what, what just happened? <laughs> like, how? No, wait a minute. How did that just work? And I say, like, are you tricking me? I'm like, I didn't. No, I'm not tricking you. I didn't try to talk you into telling you it was going to be better. I just asked the question. You tell me, is it clearer or calmer when I do this? And then, of course, when you have that experience, you, you immediately want to look again, Yes. see if you get the same effect. Of course. So I tell you that example because, one, it's a great opportunity to discuss that 2020 is not enough and that there's a whole lot more going on that people didn't know about. It also ties, it may also tie in to when we go out front and talk to one of my staff about the kind of frame I'm going to tell that patient to pick out because I might tell that patient, you know, you need to get a frame that's got a full wire, a full plastic rim to it. Don't get a rimless frame. Don't get a thin wire frame. I want you to get a thicker frame with thicker temples and thicker eye wire because we want to use that frame like the black rings that you just told me are clearer and calmer. And sometimes the, sometimes the black rings don't really make a difference and that's okay. Because then we'll continue on with some other testing strategies to then compare their outcomes with their standard prescription. Or if I add color or prism over the top of their glasses prescription, I have a variety of ways that we're going to determine that outcome. And one of the outcomes that I love when it works, it is powerful. Yeah. I will have those patients sit in my exam chair, look up at over, look up at one of my overhead fluorescent lights and ask them to simply breathe, take two or three deep breaths. And they do. And I, and I watch their chest and abdomen when they do that and get an idea if that's easy or effortful, then I'll give them prism or color or some combination of things and have them do it again. And I can't tell you how many people 
take the glasses back down and look at me and say, how does this possibly work? Because that is remarkably easier for me to breathe. Now, let's tell our friends on the other side of the speaker again that th- these are lenses that have could have a little bit of color tint to them. These are lenses that could have a little color tint. And I've got a whole briefcase of colors in my office. I've got about 50 pair of lenses, a variety of different colors, different shading of each of the colors. Most people that I do this with and most of the research that I read over the last 15 or more years, blue itself is a very calming color. So if you have a nervous system, if you're prone to anxiety, if you're prone to motion sickness, if you're prone to headaches, if you're prone to high distractibility, you've got a nervous system that is functionally hypersensitive. And if you're one of those patients, you don't like bright colors. You don't like looking through bright colors. You don't like looking at bright colors. You don't want bright colors in your house, at home, you're not going to typically wear bright colored clothing because yellows and reds and oranges take a hypersensitive nervous system and make it even more hypersensitive. Which gives somebody a sense of anxiety. It does. So that person is going to, their breathing is going to be worse if I haven't looked up at my lights, let's say through a yellow, orange, or red lens. But the more calming colors, blues, lavenders, sages, those are more calming, and it really changes their breathing outcomes. And I, I love talking about that stuff because it's powerful, and people get an appreciation that they aren't having an exam like they've had elsewhere. Well, you say it's powerful, and I can just tell you from my own family's experience, when my wife was in there, I mentioned earlier that she's come to see you, and fluorescent light bothers her. And so she is a substitute teacher, and every day she's in a different school, and the lighting is different at each school and a lot of it is fluorescent if not all of it and sometimes they flicker and there are some schools that she will not substitute there anymore because the light bothers her well i I haven't told you this yet so she wears her glasses with a slight blue tint in them everywhere to watch our son play volleyball in the big gyms with the lighting uh watching tv at night but then she tried one school where she stopped going because the light bothered her and it doesn't bother her anymore so now she doesn't have to limit where she spends her time because it doesn't bother her anymore, all because of that little shift with a slight prescription, I believe, in her in her glasses as well. But mostly, it's that that blue tint. She loves them. She looks great in them, and uh, it's helped her quite a bit. You know, Tim. That I, of course, I always love to hear stories like that, and it's exactly why I practice this way. I can't imagine not practicing this way, and I can't imagine how anyone could not practice this way. Because that, those are life-changing experiences, and they, they are. They're powerful. And what seems like a little thing, it has given her options to substitute back at any probably variety of schools that where she was limiting her choices before. Now she doesn't have to. That's powerful stuff. It so, is powerful stuff. And, you know, and I said before, Dr. Steffi, that you know, I, I can say with great authority that the way you practice is very different extremely different because, and I'll say it again for those that might not have had the opportunity to listen to episodes one or two, but you know, I have a video production marketing company and I've filmed dozens and dozens of optometrists here in the Southern California area where we're recording and none of them. And I mean that none of them compares to what you do, Dr. Steffi, which is why you are the one and only optometrist we have here on the Inbound Podcasting Network, because you've been saying for a long time, listen, the world needs to hear this stuff. This is very different. The questions you ask, the way you practice, and the enthusiasm of which you speak of how you do this. And I could see the joy in your face when I was telling that story about my wife. Um, it really is astounding. Well, and, and for the people listening to this, you have to understand that when I first met Tim a couple of years ago and we did some videos for my website and we did talk about this stuff and he did say to me, well, you really need to get the word out better. And I said, well, okay, I, I hear you. I hear you. And then we didn't do anything for a while. And then we did some other videos together and he's like, Hey, you really need to do some podcasting. I said, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll you know, I'll think about it. I'll put it on the, I'll put it on the calendar of things to do. And, and I do remember probably a year or so ago, Uh, having a conversation with Tim and saying, Tim, so what you're really saying is 
that I should just listen to you and get out of my own way <laughs> and have you help me spread this message. And that's why we're doing this. Well, it is a joy to, to be able to bring this to people and hopefully uh, open their eyes, pun intended, <laughs> as to how they can manage uh, what, what they're doing with their eyes. You know, like we said, this is the title of this topic is 2020 is not enough. And you alluded to the topic that we're going to have next time, seeing fast polyvagal therapy. Well, I and I'm excited about it. So make sure you come back and listen to the next episode because motion processing or seeing fast and the polyvagal theory of affect and emotion, it's huge in our lives and in ways that you just you don't know. And it's so not connected to 2020, but it has everything to do with how we read body language and gestural language and facial expressions and how we develop those skills in ourselves and it, it's a powerful talk, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the next episode. Thank you for listening to the Move, Look, and Listen podcast with Dr. Doug Steffi, brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial Audible membership at audibletrial.com forward slash inbound. You'll find over 180,000 titles to choose from, including books mentioned here, in the Move, Look, and Listen podcast. You can listen to these books through your iPhone, your Android, your Kindle, your computer, or even an MP3 player. And if for any reason and at any time you choose to cancel your membership, you keep all of your audiobook downloads. Give it a shot for 30 days. You got nothing to lose. Support the Move, Look, and Listen podcast by visiting audibletrial.com forward slash inbound. We will include a link for your convenience in the show notes of this and every episode of the podcast. And of course, if you'd like some more information regarding Dr. Steffi's practice or to make an appointment, we will include links in the show notes to Dr. Steffi's website and his YouTube channel. Dr. Steffi's website is steffioptometry.com. That's S-T-E-P-H-E-Y optometry.com. You can also call the office at 626 626- 332-4510. Again, all of Dr. Steffi's contact information will be included in the show notes of each and every episode. One last request before we let you go on to the next episode, please subscribe to the podcast from whichever platform you might be listening in. Of course, it is free to subscribe and it ensures that every time we post a new episode, you'll find it right there waiting for you to listen in your podcast app of choice. We really do appreciate you listening. And until next time, for Dr. Steffi of the Move, Look, and Listen podcast, I'm Tim Edwards with the Inbound Podcasting Network.